All right, welcome back. So um, Ted Baruti with his crack research has confirmed uh, there were seven trials in the Western District of Texas under Judge Albright. And uh, we have two, def uh, I'm sorry, two plaintiff wins, five defense wins, he assures me. And he gave me a list of the cases. I won't read them. But anyways, wanted to at least uh, uh, disclose that so we can get our facts exactly right. So welcome back. So yeah, we're talking patent law and institutional choice. Uh, our next panel is the Federal Circuit. Is its exclusive jurisdiction still needed given the Supreme Court's renewed interest in resolving disputes over patent law? So let me introduce our panelists, a really long name for the panel. Um, first, we've got Laura Pedraza Farina. She's an as Associate Dean for Innovation and Partnerships and a Professor of Law at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law. She graduated from Oberlin College prior to earning her PhD in genetics from Yale University and her JD from Harvard Law School. Uh, she previously worked at Covington and Burling and was a part of the faculty at Georgetown Law before joining Northwestern. Uh, our next panelist is Paul Guliuza. He's a professor of law at Temple University Beasley School of Law. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Oklahoma and he graduated summa cum laude from Tulane University School of Law. He clerked for Judge Ronald Gould of the Ninth Circuit and worked for Jones Day in its issues and appeals group prior to entering academia. I have the awkward moment of introducing myself, but I will do so. Uh, so it's what I deserve for making myself a panelist and a moderator, I guess. But uh, so yes, I'm the director of the Thai Center here at SMU. I'm a professor of law. I graduated from Texas A&M uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and then from Harvard Law School. I clerked for Judge Sharon Prost at the Federal Circuit and before law school, I worked as an applications engineer at National Instruments in Austin and um, after law school, I worked at Baker Botts here in Dallas. So uh, welcome to my other panelists, I guess. For this panel, let me just introduce uh, the topic. So we're considering the role of the Federal Circuit in today's patent system. And as for the relevant background, I think here we just should recognize the Federal Circuit was formed in 1982. Uh, President Reagan in Congress created it then, at least in part to eliminate forum shopping. We were talking about forum shopping earlier at the district court level, but this was forum shopping at the appellate level, and in part due to the Supreme Court not resolving splits of authority in the field of patent law amongst the regional appellate courts. And so the patent owners who were choosing their jurisdictions would choose the jurisdiction they preferred based on that regional circuit's patent interpretations or patent law interpretations. So in the last year, 10 years though, the Supreme Court has turned out to hear oral argument and issue opinions in numerous patent cases. We've talked about many of them today. Um, at least two each term, although none so far this term, uh, but it's not over. And in one term, there were six cases. Um, so the Supreme Court is very much more interested in resolving disputes over patent law today than it was prior to 1982. And given this, the panel is going to consider the question whether the Federal Circuit's exclusive jurisdiction is still needed, and more broadly, what is the role for the Federal Circuit in the nation's current institutional structure for resolving patent disputes when the Supreme Court is much more active. So with that, let me ask Professor, maybe I should say Dr. Pedraza to provide her opening remarks. Thank you, uh, David. Um, so let me start um, by talking about sort of the bottom line of what I wanna talk about uh, today. So I wanna talk about three things. Um, first, to go over briefly arguments um, about the creation of the Federal Circuit, um, arguments that um, are based on sort of two principles that sometimes can be at odds with each other, um, the principle of uniformity and the principle of expertise. Um, and then I want to frame one way um, to potentially understand what the Supreme Court is doing when it takes up patent law decisions. Um, and um, argue that there's a thread in the Supreme, in Supreme Court opinions that is a push against formalistic rule-driven legal doctrines and sort of trying to open up uh, patent law to a more contextual um, standard-based uh, type of methodology. Um, and then sort of my bottom line, right, in terms of the question that we're asked to consider um, today, um, I guess my bottom line has multiple parts, right? Um, so on the one hand, um, I think that if we want this expertise, the Federal Circuit is a strange place uh, to put expertise and that the expertise can and should be located um, 
either at the fact finding state, but stage, but most uh, realistically um, at the patent and trademark office. So um, this sort of ties back to some of the uh, other panels, right? Um, in that I think we're getting there with the PTAB and the expansion of the PTO to include really important types of expertise, including expertise in economics. Um, and so that I think the PTO is a good place uh, to sort of expand this expertise. Um, I would also say that I think um, from a policy perspective, rulemaking authority is a good idea, although I realize the sort of real world limits um, to making that happen. Um, and, um, and then going back to the more crucial question about what about the federal circuit? Well, I think that the need for uniformity now is really um, overblown uh, because what, what has happened uh, with this sort of um, focus on this um, bright line rules is that um, there hasn't really been a sort of creative and flexible approach to fast advancing technology. And perhaps, and this is sort of, I'm tentative about this, right? But perhaps uh, circuit competition can arguably do better than uh, centralization. So that's gonna be sort of my bottom line. And I'll just back up a little bit and spend a little bit of time um, sort of fleshing out um, those uh, points. Um, so as I mentioned um, earlier, so right, a key argument for um, the creation of the federal circuit was the need for uniformity in patent law. Um, and as David mentioned, this had to do in part um, with the fact that circuit courts varied widely, right, in their rates in upholding patents as being valid. And so therefore you could, um, you could sort of try to figure out where to position your case so you would get a favorable um, a favorable um, decision. And of course, the Supreme Court wasn't really intervening. Um, and this, you know, if in the face of non-intervention, this wide variation, right, was thought to create this really chilling effect on innovation by increasing ex ante uncertainty regarding the validity of a patent or the strength of a patent, right? And the idea there was very much a model that focused on notice and certainty and notice and certainty as being crucial for having a robust um, innovation environment, right? Um, and so when we think about the federal circuit, oftentimes um, uh, we talk about the federal circuit as a specialized or semi-specialized court, court, but in many ways, I think it's best or more accurate to conceptualize it as a court that centralizes litigation, right, in a quest for uniform and clear legal rules to guide technological innovation. Um, and, um, and so what do I mean by clear rules? I'll just give you some examples which will probably be familiar to you and also examples as to how the Supreme Court has disagreed with this approach, right? Which is very much a methodological approach. So um, a note on this methodology, right, of the federal circuit. So there's a thread running through many federal circuit opinions. Um, uh, and this is this preference for bright line rules when announcing and interpreting the patent statute. So for example, the thread runs through patent double subject matter opinions, right? So the federal circuit is struggling with patent double subject matter and coming up with a machine or transformation test, right? Um, and again, as we see uh, in the Supreme Court opinions, which we could argue whether they, you know, they created an enormous mess, but if you should think about the methodology, uh, patent double subject matters opinions are about being contextual, about not creating uh, this sort of bright line rules. Um, you could see it in non-obviousness decisions, right? Um, this idea uh, in the cases prior to KSR to try to craft um, a rule uh, that would prevent hindsight bias. And again, the federal, the Supreme Court very clearly in KSR um, arguing against the formal rule, right? You could see it in eBay, um, whether the Federal Circuit had a bright line rule favoring injunctions and the Supreme Court, and in particular, sort of Kennedy's concurrence is really, um, perhaps oddly, really engaging with the technology on the ground and something that, um, that the Federal Circuit was not doing, right? And you could also see more recently in decisions on attorney fees, uh, the exceptional case law, for example, in Octane Fitness. So my claim, and then sort of I've written a paper a while back on this, is that, you know, Supreme Court basically um, in each one of these cases has called for a case by case analysis um, that's grounded on the realities of technological innovation. And, and perhaps it's a bit ironic that it is the Supreme Court that has at least tried um, to engage with sort of the economics and sociology and structural aspects of innovation more deeply than the federal circuit um, was willing to do, right? Um, and um, in fact, I think one may say that the federal circuit has and continues to have this preference for bright line rules. And what sometimes we could 
think of as a deep ambivalence about engaging with the realities of on the ground innovation and economic and sociological facts of innovation on the ground. Um, and so it's worth thinking about where does this preference come from? Um, and I think it's tied to two features. One, um, I talked about that feature already, which is this strong preference for uniformity and certainty. And arguably this um, is right from the perspective of the Federal Circuit's mandate, right? So if you look at why uh, the Federal Circuit was created, you could say the Federal Circuit is being faithful to this initial idea that we needed uniformity. Um, and another aspect that I think can explain um, the flavor and the, the content of those rules actually ties back to a second feature that many um, scholars and observers have tied to the Federal Circuit, which is the, the idea of the Federal Circuit being, being an expert court, right? Um, and so let me just say a few words about this idea of expertise. Um, and so what is the argument, right? Because you could make an argument for expertise um, that we need the Federal Circuit to have this, this uh, this expertise. And I think we need to sort of disaggregate when we talk about expertise, expertise in what? Um, and so you could think about the federal circuit as potentially being an expert um, along different dimensions, right? Um, so in a, on the one hand, you could say by virtue of being centralized, right? They're experts uh, through learning by doing. So they see an enormous amount of patent cases. Um, they're just legal experts in patent law and potentially get some sort of expertise in their technology by being exposed to all of these cases, right? And at least a comfort with the technology. Um, you could also say that another type of expertise that's important um, is expertise in the underlying technology, right? Um, and there, if you look at the biographies of the judges, it's really not clear that that's how um, they're being selected, right? So some judges have technological expertise, but only a few other judges have sort of more patent law expertise. So it's unclear you can really make an argument that there's a strong reservoir of expertise along these two lines. And in fact, um, it can be a bit dangerous if you have only a few judges uh, that have deep expertise in technology, right? Because you might imagine um, a sort of overly, judges becoming overly deferential to the technological expertise um, of uh, specific uh, specific uh, judges. So then at the end, you might have like one particular judge getting, for example, all the expertise, let's say on the chemical cases. Um, so, but going back to this idea of expertise, I wanted to make one last point that I think that one, another explanation for the Federal Circuit's focus on, on uniform rules can come from expertise. Um, and this has to do with this idea that um, you, the Federal Court, uh, Federal Circuit is an appellate court. Um, and, and in many studies of expertise in other disciplines, you know, right, if you wanna train novices or if you want to constrain uh, the discretion of novices, the best way to do that is to give them rules, right? So one way to think about what the Federal Circuit is doing is very skeptical of the district court's ability to be able to reach the right decision and coming up with these sort of bright line rules to constrain decision-making. There's studies in political science that suggest that this happens in courts in general, but it happens largely when the political uh, party or the political political alignment of the sort of appellate court um, is different from the political alignment of the district court and you're going to see more rules in that way so rules as a way to constrain the discretion of uh, the district um, of the district court right um, but um, but it's unclear whether this is normatively desirable right so you have rules to constrain district court this the discretion but at the same time um, a court that is at, at an appellate level um, not really able to uh, to make sort of rich uh, contextual uh, fact findings, right? Because that's the province of the district court. Um, and in fact, uh, this idea of constraining the district courts doesn't seem to be something that the Supreme Court is agreeing with, right? We have a Supreme Court that's asking and prodding the Federal Circuit to employ its deep expertise more. You can see this thread in cases such as KSR. So what is the solution, right? Um, so um, two points. One. Um, I do think that patent law is an area where you need a robust agency, right? And so if we're trying to come up with what is the best way to match patent doctrine to the realities, to the economic and sociological and structural realities of innovation, um, 
The federal circuit could do more along those lines, but arguably an appeals court is not the place to do it. Um, so I think I would agree, um, for example, Artie Rye and, and Stuart Benjamin had a proposal to create an, an executive office of innovation. That uh, That's really attractive. So but my main bottom line would be, you need to have economic and sociological expertise. And the PTO is showing us that it's actually kind of interested in, in applying that expertise. So I would say expand the PTO. Um, and then in terms of the federal circuit, um, I would say, that we probably so this is more tentative I think than 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 a strong uh, a strong coming down on one side or the other uh, but that it's time to open up uh, the the circuits to experimentation right we don't have that concern that we had earlier um, and uniformity is not the only value right so experimentation uh, and creativity and how you think about uh, the law might actually better fit the realities of, of sort of fast evolving technological innovation right and I'll stop there thank you. All right, Professor Guliusa. Thanks, David. And I was going to say at the outset, you know, you could have recruited one of us to read your bio for you. Um, that like that's the least like the least we could have done for you um, for organizing this really interesting conference. So next time, next time, just let me know, and I'm happy to uh, read your bio off the SME website. Um, all right. So uh, thanks so much, for that. and thanks um, Laura for those um, interesting remarks. I have a few thoughts that hopefully we'll get a chance to respond directly to what you said. Um, but actually, I think I can kind of jump off um, where you left off. You left off talking about experimentation. And I was going to start talking about experimentation as well, but maybe in a little bit um, of a different sense. So in the sense that the federal, you're, I think you're talking about experimentation, like between the circuits about what the law ought to be. Um, and I think it's important to note that the federal circuit itself was a bit of an experiment, right? So um, Professor Rochelle Dreyfus, um, writing about like 20 years ago, um, wrote an article called The Federal Circuit, A Continuing Exper uh, Experiment and Specialization. And I think um, one of the things, you know, like probably a lot of scientists in the room today, um, one of the things about an experiment, right, like at some point you need to step back and say like, did my experiment succeed? Um, and so we're about almost 40 years into the, we're 39 years into the Federal Circuit experiment now, we'll be at the 40th anniversary of the court um, beginning operations about a year from now. And so I think it's high time that like we step back and say like, has this thing worked? Um, and if not, take seriously um, some, some discussions and thoughts about alternatives. Um, and so, you know, not to beat around the bush uh, and, and, and bury the lead or anything, I will say, I think the answer to whether the federal circuit as an experiment has succeeded is no. Um, I think it's been a worthwhile experiment. Um, we've learned a lot, um, but ultimately I'm not sure the patent system or the judicial system or society is better off um, because of the existence of the federal circuit. And one place we can start to sort of, you know, take that assessment is look at the reasons for which the court was created in the first place. Um, and so as we've discussed, you know, Congress created the federal circuit, at least if you sort of believe the conventional story that's told in the legislative history um, to achieve uniformity in patent law. Um, but I think that goal has been pretty elusive. Uh, you know, as the title of this panel suggests, the Supreme Court has fre you know, frequently intervenes to upend federal circuit doctrine. Um, all of us, I'm sure, could come up with lots of examples where the federal circuit's own judges disagree vehemently with one another about fundamental issues of patent law, right? Ranging from patentable subject matter to the frameworks for conducting claim construction or the frameworks for assessing non-obviousness to the roles of the judge and jury in patent disputes, um, among many others, right? I'm sure we could all create a long list. Um, and that's just legal uniformity, like uniformity about what the law is, right? There's also another aspect of uniformity that drove the federal circuit's creation, which is what I've called um, in some other work, adjudicative uniformity. Uniformity, right? The sense that a single patent should be treated consistently from one case to another. Um, but we can't even get that anymore, uh, or the federal circuit can't provide that anymore, right? One of the reasons um, is the creation of the PTAB, right? Now that we have post-issuance proceedings, the PTAB that can consider the exact same validity issues that the district courts can consider, it's not unusual for a court to uphold a patent's validity only for the PTAB to later strike it down or vice versa, right? And that's not even to mention the various doctrines of preclusion that prohibit imposing 
decisions from prior cases on non parties to those future uh, in, to on, on non parties to those original cases in future cases. So I think the the abil federal circuit's ability to provide uniformity, you know, has always been limited, and I think we've seen some of those limitations pretty starkly over the past couple of decades. So uniformity is kind of like the main reason that you find in the conventional telling for creating the court. Um, another not so secret reason the court was created was to strengthen patent rights, right? Um, these worries are coming out of these worries in the 1970s about the United States economic competitiveness, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Japan, um, and the hope that by strengthening patents, we'd somehow strengthen the American economy. Um, but I don't think the court has actually done that either, right? Um, at least not unflinchingly. Uh, to be sure, the Federal Circuit has tried to expand patentability in various ways, probably most notably patentable subject matter, um, but also non-obviousness, thinking about the old TSM test that the Supreme Court ultimately abrogated. Um, but as that example suggests, the Supreme Court has pushed back against those expansions. And in fact, the Federal Circuit itself has sometimes constricted patentability in notable ways. Um, for example, by reconfirming, and I think in recent years, strengthening the written description requirements, um, limiting the validity of means plus function claims. I think there's other areas we can, we can flag as well where the court, where the Federal Circuit has not been consistently expansive, in, uh, the Federal Circuit has not been consistently expansive in terms of patentability. Um, likewise on infringement, um, you know, doctrine and outcomes at the Federal Circuit, there's been a lot of scholarship on this, I think suggests it's pretty well balanced, right? It's not, the Federal Circuit isn't particularly um, favorable to accused infringers um, or particularly unfavorable to them either. Um, so uh, that raises, I guess, one question of if the court hasn't provided uniformity, it hasn't strengthened patent rights, like, is there anything we can say about what the patent, what the court has done that we might draw conclusions about whether it succeeded as an experiment or not. And I think one important effect of the federal circuit is that the court has made the patent system, and by implication, the court itself, extremely important. Right. Um, since Congress created the Federal Circuit, the number of patents issued annually has grown by over 500 percent. Right. Patents, patent cases are now front page news. Right. As the title of this panel suggests, the Supreme Court now is extremely interested in patent law, which 40 years ago might have been written off as sort of an arcane area that only specialized lawyers with technical backgrounds are interested in. Uh, the amount of litigation and the patent litigation of the district courts has increased substantially. Um, and patent practice in general is no longer a niche area for specialist lawyers, right? It's a big money maker at large general practice firms. Um, you know, all of us on the on the panelist side of this panel, right? We're all professors at law schools that now have like one or more patent law professors, right? Many law schools. Um, as recently as a decade or two ago, I had no patent law professors, and now pretty much every law school has one or at least more than one, right? While all this expansion of the patent system is happening, um, we still remain pretty unsure about whether patents in fact encourage more inventions or better inventions than we get without them to say nothing about the patent system's overall impact on social welfare, right? I think the best we can say is that the relationship between patents and innovation seems to depend on the industry, right? Probably makes sense in say pharmaceuticals, but we're pretty skeptical in the area of say computers and communication technology, right? Um, so uh, what do we do, right? If we don't know if patents are, are, are good for society or not, we've got the specialized patent court. Um, well, one goal we might have is just trying to reduce the cost of patent litigation as much as possible, right, without too overly sacrificing accuracy of outcomes. And I think it's when you really view the Federal Circuit's performance through that cost or accuracy trade-off that it becomes clear the experiment has been a failure, right? So one of the worries about specialized government bodies like the Federal Circuit is that they'll become captured by the parties that they regulate and shape the law to favor those entities and not the public interest. Um, but federal circuit doctrine, federal circuit outcomes, right, like they're relatively balanced between patentees and accused infringers. Um, and I think, you know, there's a good case to be made that overall the court has avoided becoming captured by the litigants that appear before it. But I think the focus on the litigants and the avoidance of capture by the litigants that, you know, 
is not new, right? It was part of the Federal Circuit's legislative history as well, saying like, oh, patentees and accused infringers are often on different sides of the case. You know, what patentee in one case is an infringer in another, so we'll cancel each other out, we won't get captured. It obscures the fact that the court really has very little interest in reducing the social cost of patent litigation by making outcomes more predictable. Because by making outcomes more predictable and reducing costs of litigation, it would displease another group that's very interested in the federal circuit. And I think that's the patent bar, right? Um, so by ex expanding or trying to expand the categories of patentable inventions, I think what the federal circuit has done generally is encourage companies to obtain and acquire patents. At the same time, um, by keeping it law, the law of infringement relatively balanced or a cynic might say unpredictable, um, that makes vigorously defending against most infringement claims a pretty plausible strategy too, right? And so all of this stirs both the patent litigation and patent prosecution pots. It creates um, sort of a higher profile for patent litigation and it creates a lot of work for patent lawyers. And it's sort of a cycle that feeds itself as there's more patent litigation, uh, patent law becomes a more prominent area of practice and the federal circuit becomes a more prominent legal institution. And for judges that are on an Article III court, receive fixed salaries, have life tenure um, in a relatively narrow area of subject matter jurisdiction, I think like the non-pecuniary rewards of prestige and attention and popularity from the bar, right? there are whole conferences dedicated to the courts, um, those things matter. And so consciously or not, I think we get a patent law that by and large just generates more, lit more work uh, for patent lawyers for the patent bar, but doesn't necessarily serve the patent interest, the, the public's interest, right? So what can we do about this? You know, I think there's lots of ideas out there. We could allow a few additional circuits to hear patent cases. I've suggested in some of my work tweaking the court's non-patent jurisdiction uh, to bring in some more non-patent cases to sort of um, help the court maybe less self-identify as the patent court. Um, but I think like more and more, you know, maybe it's more simpler and just more realistic to just declare the court a failed experiment and abolish it altogether and go back to the world as it was in September of 1982. Um, obviously, there's a lot to unpackage there. Um, and, um, you know, there's some complications about reassigning uh, the court's Article Three life tenure judges. There's also, you know, important to think about what we would do with the non-patent litigants at the federal circuit. You know, there's some surprising benefits, I think, for say military veterans, for having those veterans benefits cases centralized in one court uh, that actually pays a lot of attention to those cases and takes them very seriously. So I think there are some institutional design complications to so just like blow, you know, you just blow up the federal circuit and, and forget about it. Um, but I think they can be overcome. And I think, I think the benefits at the end of the day would be worthwhile. Excellent. All right. Thanks. And so um, I, I love the topic. That's why I put myself on the panel, I guess. I don't know. I love all the topics, really. But um, so so let me give my opening remarks. So then maybe after that, we can all have an opportunity just to, I don't know, uh, comment on everybody else's points. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, I think Congress created the federal circuit to eliminate form shopping. Or we could say it's for purposes of uh, uniformity. It's another way of describing it that the other two panelists have described it. Interestingly enough, I would say um, the problem then was the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme Court wasn't resolving circuit splits. That's what created the lack of uniformity. The circuit splits persisted. Patent owners chose to file patent infringement lawsuits in district courts that, that were required to follow circuit decisions that were more favorable to patent owners. They would pick their jurisdiction, right? We, we, we saw that. We still see that today. Now it's based on procedure at district courts, not so much about we don't have disuniformity, we have uniformity. And as I tell my students uh, when we talk about the federal circuit, actually, I think the uniformity was created the moment the federal circuit um, started its operations, or maybe in its first decision when it said our decisions by our panels will have to be uh, followed by future panels. And so just the creation of the federal circuit created uniformity. And it's interesting, uh, you still see though the judges in some cases saying, well, uniformity is an important consideration in patent law, in part because of the creation of the federal circuit. I might say, well, uniformity was, we're done with, you know, we have uniformity, we have the federal circuit, it doesn't need to be an added thumb on the scale necessarily. But, but anyways, the point being, the problem when, and the reason for the creation of the federal circuit, again, at least the main reason, the explicit reason 
was actually a problem with the Supreme Court. Uh, but the Supreme Court's failure to resolve circuit splits was not always the problem. So until 1891, the Supreme Court was required and did hear and decide numerous patent cases each year. That was because until that year, Congress had defined the Supreme Court's jurisdiction as appellate jurisdiction. In other words, the court was required to review cases appealed to it. As a result, there were not circuit splits. But there was another problem. In 1891, uh, Congress solved that problem, and they thought they solved that problem, by creating, as it turns out, the intermediate appellate courts as we know them today. And at that point, they also gave the Supreme Court petition jurisdiction over patent cases decided by these intermediate appellate courts. In other words, Congress wanted to grant the Supreme Court the power to use its own discretion to decide whether to review appellate decisions in patent cases. Okay, one of the main reasons Congress did this is because the Supreme Court was overburdened. They had too many cases and there was long delays in the Supreme Court deciding its cases. Interestingly, it was around that same time that groups began calling for the creation of a specialized patent court. In, in, in this regard, I recommend to all of you Professor Paul Janicki's excellent 2002 article, To Be or Not to Be, The Long Gestation of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, 1887 to 1982. So there he notes that there were bills in Congress to create a national patent court, and they began to appear in 1887. So it was, a, it was a long period of gestation. Then, though, as I noted, this was before 1891, the Supreme Court had appellate jurisdiction over patent cases. So the problem then could not have been circuit splits regarding interpretations of patent law. Indeed, that wasn't the problem. As explained by someone named Margaret Conway in a document she prepared for the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary in 1959, the problem was that the Supreme Court was taking too long to decide appeals in patent cases. As she explained, and I'm gonna quote, the average lapse of time became 10 years and again, quoting, measured against the 17 year life of the patent, the time spent in litigation took up more than half of the exploitable life of the grant. So Congress created these intermediate appellate courts, not the federal circuit, but all of the regional appellate courts, they gave the Supreme Court discretionary jurisdiction to decide whether to review the decisions of the circuit courts. But interestingly, even after 1891, this, and here's another quote from Conway, this arrangement merely resulted to a considerable extent in there being nine different courts of last resort. And so this generated another problem that turns out caused congressmen to continue to file bills, despite the change in law in 1891, they continue to file bills to create, again, a national patent court. These bills, interestingly enough, were filed every term between 1887 and 1921. And so in 1906, there was a hearing on one of these bills and it was debated. <clears throat> and in 1906, the justification for a national patent court, it shifted, right? It wasn't the long time to decide cases, but it was a circuit split actually justification for a national patent court. It was a little bit different though. In the words of someone named T.S. Fisher who testified in favor of a national patent court in 1906, and here's a quote, the main reason for this bill is to have a single patent court of final jurisdiction. And if we could just in every case get one decision which should extend all over the country and be binding on every circuit, in 99 out of 100 cases, that would be all that was needed. So in other words, he wanted a single patent court to have its decisions regarding patent infringement and validity to apply nationwide. So one explanation might be that the courts at that time had not discovered the concept of a nationwide injunction, a controversial concept used by district judges today in uh, other areas of the law, it's more controversial, they're doing it in patent cases. Moreover, at that time, the Supreme Court had not yet determined as it finally did in 1971, in the case of Blonder Tongue Laboratories versus the University of Illinois Foundation, that, and now I'm gonna use a professor term, non-mutual collateral estoppel applied in patent cases. That is, since 1971, a determinant of invalidity of a patent in a final and unappealable judgment rendered by any intermediate appellate court, it's binding on the patent owner, even in other cases against other accused infringers. That was not always the case. By similar reasoning, reasoning, a determination of no invalidity of a patent in a final and unappealable judgment rendered by any intermediate appellate court against an accused infringer ought to be binding on the accused infringer, even in other cases brought by the patent owner. Reality is, should those cases, should multiple cases be brought? 
apparently back then multiple cases would often be brought in different jurisdictions. By the way, a particularly grotesque example of the need for this lateral collateral estoppel doctrine uh, is the set of cases that I would say gave rise to the Supreme Court's determination that clear and convincing evidence is necessary to render patent claims invalid. So in an earlier panel, we were discussing Microsoft versus I4I, and that's the case I'm talking about, but it's reliance on an earlier case. The earlier case is the one I wanna focus on. So the I4I case was in 2011, and in that case, the Supreme Court held that the statutory presumption of validity dictates that clear and convincing evidence is needed to prove patent claims invalid. Notably though, the primary support for the court's conclusion was an older Supreme Court opinion. Some people call it, I think RCA, but Radio Court versus Radio Engineering Laboratories. In that case, if you dig into the facts, and I have, the same invalidity issue was being raised for the fourth time. The facts addressed by the court in that case concerned a matter litigated repeatedly in various courts between the same rival claimants using the same evidence. So in my view, it's no wonder that when the Supreme Court considered that the same evidence had not proven invalidity in three prior cases, it decided in that case that clear and convincing evidence would be required to prove invalidity in the fourth case. And that's not only because the patent had issued by the patent office, but because the courts had repeatedly reviewed that evidence and it was not proving invalidity. Regardless, after the development of collateral estoppel in 1971, there were not cries for the creation of a national patent court based on inconsistent determinations of validity of patents between intermediate appellate courts. After 1971, and that was the Blonder Tongue case, non-mutual defense of collateral estoppel, what was the justification for the creation of a national patent court? That brings us back to where we started, the need for, to eliminate forum shopping based on unresolved circuit splits, not with respect to the validity of patents, but regarding what patent law is, the interpretation of the law, the understanding of the law. Indeed, right, as we discussed, that was the basis for the creation of the Federal Circuit in 1982, at least one of the major reasons for its formation. So what is this brief, hopefully it was brief, historical overview of calls for a national patent court teach us? In my view, it teaches us that over time, the justification for a national patent court changed from early, the delay in resolving appeals in patent cases. Second, circuit splits regarding the validity of patents. And third, circuit splits regarding what patent law is. In short, I think there've been three justifications for a national patent court over time. And importantly, today, we arguably have none of those problems. Uh, delay in resolving appeals in patent cases, I don't think we have that problem. Circuit splits regarding the ability of patents, well, we have the Supreme Court's 1971 decision, non-mutual defensive collateral estoppel. I think, at least in that respect, we've eliminated that problem. And circuit splits, we have the Federal Circuit, and right now, we don't have circuit splits in patent law. Of course, the topic for today is, do we need the patent law? I'm sorry, do we need the Federal Circuit given the Supreme Court's interest in deciding patent disputes? And so if we did away with the Federal Circuit, I think there's reason to think that even without it, we might still not have any of those three problems. So then I come to the question, why then have a Federal Circuit with exclusive jurisdiction over appeals and patent cases? So in response to this question, I highlight now a fourth historical problem with the Supreme Court's treatment of patent law it often gets patent law wrong. So consider first the wrong-headed policy-oriented decision-making of the Supreme Court in patent cases in the middle of the 20th century. And obviously I'm making a normative position and people can disagree on the merits, but there are some particularly egregious examples of the Supreme Court's view of the relevant policies. And they, as it turned out, re relate to the so-called invention requirement. First, consider Judge Justice Douglas's flash of genius requirement articulated by him in the Kuno engineering case. He effectively said that to get a patent, a flash of genius is required. In other words, I think what it means is, first, only geniuses get patents. And only, second, when they come up with their idea in a very short amount of time. Maybe it was a flare of words, but if you read it, that's what it seems to mean. Apparently, a normal person's hard work and trial and error that didn't merit any reward in the sense of a patent, no matter the uniqueness of the invention, I'll call it an invention, or the utility of the invention, if we want to call it the thing they created. As another example, consider the pronouncement in Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company versus Supermarket Equipment Corp, another old case from the middle of this, the 20th century, that here's a quote, a patent for a combination 
of old elements, now this is not a quote, must somehow change the elements' respective functions. In this way, the Supreme Court created a test that by its terms, I think, is impossible to pass in reality. In both respects, Congress had to pass the 1952 Patent Act to reverse the Supreme Court's misguided understanding of the inventive process and replace the old invention requirement with the new statutory non-obviousness requirement. So that's one example. More recently, John Golden has explained how the Supreme Court has made mistakes even attempting to apply general principles of law in patent cases. And a particularly egregious example he uses uh, to make his point is eBay versus Merck Exchange, where the court's opinion uh, in not just one, but two respects actually flubbed the law of permanent injunctions. And even more recently, Jeff Lefston and Peter Minnell, and if you know my research, you know I'm gonna go to patent eligibility and I think uh, an earlier panelist might be happy with my views on this point, but uh, Jeff Lefson and Peter Manel have demonstrated how badly the Supreme Court misunderstood its own precedent in the area of patent eligibility when it decided Mayo versus Prometheus in 2012. And effectively, what they did was reinsert into patent law an invention requirement, um, resurrecting a, a requirement that the 1952 Patent Act had seemed to displace. Indeed, uh, I think the court did not learn from Congress's elimination of that invention requirement in 1952. In Mayo in 2012, it reinserted it into patent law. Uh, and, but now it's in the form of a search for an inventive concept, something more than just identifying a new use of a newly discovered physical phenomenon or natural law. And so we're waiting on Congress again. I've testified in favor of reform, but we're, we haven't had it yet. We're waiting on Congress again to overrule the Supreme Court. So based on the Supreme Court's errors deciding patent cases, rather than framing the debate, debate as whether to eliminate the Federal Circuit's exclusive intermediate appellate jurisdiction over appeals and patent cases, what we might ought debate is whether to eliminate the Supreme Court's petition jurisdiction in patent cases. And now that I've dropped that bomb, we can move on to get responses uh, from other panelists. So I'll turn first, I guess, to Professor Dr. Pedraza Farina. Uh, great. Um, so I have a couple of questions for uh, for both of you. Um, I'll start with uh, Paul's presentation. So I do think we may disagree, uh, right? So we we gave sort of like different understandings of what the federal circuit is trying to do. So let's like I think it'll be interesting to talk about that, right? So you um, to, you were making one a potentially causal argument that the federal circuit is aggrandizing its own importance, right? And it's making patent law more important. Um, so one thing that I would point there is that there's potentially other, so I'm, I'm not sure, it's plausible, right? But I'm curious to, to, to dig that into that a little bit more deeply because technology has become more mainstream, right? So it could be like all of these exogenous factors are just making, right? Um, so just saying that this is a federal circuit, I think um, we probably need more evidence for that. But the other point, um, is right. So the federal circuit um, being making patent law less predictable. Now I don't. So I, I noted that I thought the federal circuit was trying to come up with right line rules, uh, and I'm I waffle as to whether they're doing that to make patent law more predictable. This is this an argument at least, right? The federal circuit is trying to make patent law more predictable, and that the Supreme, Supreme Court um, is sort of messing it up, right? So I'm wondering what you would say about that. Uh, that at least in terms of the 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 uh, the rules they're trying to announce, um, that the federal circuit is is actually trying to 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 uh, to take to taking seriously the, the the idea they have to uh, reach uniformity. So that'll be sort of my question uh, for Paul. And then um, yeah, and then I I think it's just my question is more about whether. Um, we're just not falling into, for, for David, federal circuit exceptionalism, right? So what is it about patents? Um, does the Supreme Court get it wrong? Is that right? There's a normative argument. Um, did they get it wrong in KSR, right? I mean, so are we cherry picking, right? Um, and um, so is this an argument that's generalizable to like the Supreme Court just generally when it wades into technological areas, gets it wrong? Do they get it wrong in tax law? I don't know, right? So, uh, so I'm curious about whether this is a generalizable argument or is there something about, um, is there something about patent law that makes it exceptional? And then what what is it about the federal circuit that suggests that they would get it right, right? What do they have that? And 
um because i would i would argue that their expertise creates other problems that I, it's hard to it's hard for me to compare them because i do agree that the supreme court sometimes uh doesn't understand uh some fundamentals of technology um but uh but i also think the federal circuit's sort of unwillingness to engage with contextual factors on the ground leads to bad decisions as well to be my two questions should i go first all right uh awesome thank you laura uh yeah on the exogenous factors i mean i'm i uh, yes obviously that if the federal circuit is not the only factor here and i'm not sure yeah, you know, I mean, this is just, it's argument, right? It's its not, um, I can't prove there are no other factors, but I, I you know, and maybe part of this is maybe framing, frame how I think about this issue, particularly as I try to put it down on paper. Um, the, the federal circuit, I think, has played a significant role, um, but surely not the only role in the growth of the patent system and, and the increasing notoriety of patent law. Um, on the predictability point and the sort of the rules standards question. So I think, my gut reaction is like I think we can we can both be right about that in the sense that like we can say that generally the federal circuit prefers rules of rules versus standards, but by keeping the law relatively standardless in very narrow areas, it can cause a lot of uncertainty that provokes litigation, right? So it can have lots of rules about say like various validity doctrines, right? And I might suggest those rules tend to be like sort of favorable. Um, you know, favorably inclined towards patentees. But the real, like, where the nub of, of sort of litigation provocation happens, I think, is in doctrines of claim construction and questions of infringement. And, like, it's like personally, like, that's kind of like a rule less area of law, right? Like, it's very fact specific. Um, the federal circuit has at times um, exercised a pretty like aggressive standard of appellate review in both of those areas. Um, and I think like the combination of standardlessness versus aggression as an institution can really unsettle things in a way that encourages a lot of litigation. And then couple on top of that, and so here's like a bright line litigation increasing rule that I could just think of off the top of my head, which is immunity doctrines for patent owners, right? Like it, it, the Federal Circuit has made it incredibly difficult to assert a tort claim against a patentee who asserts a weak or frivolous patent infringement claim, right? And that immunity takes the form of a very bright line rule, which is that to, uh, to, to hold a patentee civilly liable for patent enforcement activity, you have to show that the patentee's claim was both objectively baseless and made in subjective bad faith, right? It's this like neat two element test that is basically impossible to satisfy, right? Um, and so it's a rule that also like encourages, I think perhaps the overly aggressive assertion of patent rights. And certainly um, a lot of MPEs have, have hidden behind that rule over the past, uh, the course of the past couple of decades. So I think, I think generally, like, I think we can live with a world in which there are lots of patent law rules, um, but patent law and the patent system also encourages pretty aggressive assertion of patent rights. I, I have some comments back, but I guess we're probably maybe going around the horn like that. Yeah, let's let's go around the horn and then we'll come back to you next, I guess. And um, so, yeah, I appreciate the question for me. Uh, the way the way I understood the question is, um, who do we want deciding patent law? Um, Patent exceptionalism, is it so exceptional that we don't want the Supreme Court deciding patent law? Um, and I think it, it ties back to this issue of expertise, actually. And I know you've written about it and you've thought probably much more than I have about it. But um, that's one potential justification for the existence of the federal circuit. Now, I recognize, and I think you highlighted, the makeup of the court does not reflect exactly the goal of expertise. Um, and that raises a question, should we require all federal circuit judges to have an engineering or science or patent background? I mean, if we really were going to focus on expertise, I think we might do that. There, you have mentioned there may be problems associated with that. Um, and I think there, there might be, but there would be benefits too. And it's a cost benefit analysis. But I will say this, we don't have historians conducting brain surgery, nor for that matter, do we have brain surgeons teaching 18th century art history, just to be fair to both professions. Um, we we like uh, expertise. The federal, the Supreme Court actually um, has brilliant people on it, but those people have 
almost zero experience in patent law until they get to the Supreme Court. And then they hear, even in a good year, three or four cases on particular topics. Now I know they actually consider more than that because they consider the petitions. Their clerks probably do a lot of that work, but they have to consider on the merits and make the decisions. But uh, in other words, the federal circuit judges, even though they don't have a requirement, of course, that they have a technical background, science or engineering, they also, when they join that court, some of them don't have experience in patent cases. And so I'll use actually Judge Eichler with Judge Prost. Uh, she didn't have background in patent law. Now she worked in the Senate Judiciary Committee and I'm sure there was IP legislation and she had some exposure to it. But when she joined the court, I don't think she would even say that I, she was an expert in, in patent law by any means, but she developed the expertise over time given the experience. So the Federal Circuit in its current existence and its current framework does provide for some expertise, even though there's not a requirement that the judges have an engineering or science background. Um, the Supreme Court, to the extent it, it uh, hears more and more patent cases, I think it, it is developing more of an expertise in patent law, certainly than it, than it had 20 years ago. It was Justice Stevens, I think, who was the last Supreme Court justice who heard patent cases as a regional um, judge. On the, it turns out he was on the Seventh Circuit. And he heard and decided patent cases before the formation of the federal circuit. But now, of course, we don't have if if we haven't had any federal circuit judges go on to be Supreme Court justices, and the other judges on the other regional courts don't have any experience. And so um, there's just a lack of expertise. And I think it goes back to that question: Do we want expertise? Um, I, I hear your point, though. Whoever decides cases is going to make mistakes or errors, and and that's that's just true, but I, I would I would like expertise, and I would trust uh, trust the experts, um, and I would hope that we would have expertise. That said, again, if the Supreme Court keeps hearing these cases, maybe they'll develop that expertise. And by the way, the role of law clerks we haven't mentioned, the Federal Circuit pretty much has forty eight, maybe it's forty seven or forty six. I think Judge Dyke doesn't always take clerks with an engineering or science background, but almost every judge, as far as I know, all of their clerks have a science or an engineering background. I'm not saying necessarily this is the, the best solution here. I'm just saying it's the reality. Um, interestingly enough, um, the last time I checked, the Supreme Court's only taken in its in the Federal Circuit's history only one law clerk who had clerked at the Federal Circuit. And um, Again, just a fact. So it, I know there's some argument sometimes, well, the law clerks provide some expertise. Um, that would kind of be a strange way of getting expertise, whether it's engineering or science expertise or expertise in patent law, either way. I think, Professor, yeah, you, maybe. So I'll send it back to you, yep. Yep, thanks. Uh, so that's great. So I, yeah, just a couple of comments and reactions to, to both of you. I think these are more comments, but I'll see if I can figure out a way to add a question mark at the very end. Um, so Laura, for you, I, I, I really enjoyed that, um, your remarks and, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the rules versus standards thing, which I think makes a lot of sense in describing the, the dynamic between the federal circuit and the Supreme Court. Um, one of the other points you made, which is really interesting, is about like, where in the hierarchy of the judicial system or the dispute resolution system do we want to locate the expertise? And there's like a really good sort of common sense argument that like, well, you put it where expertise is most valuable, um, the expertise that would be most valuable in patent cases is not necessarily the law of patents, but it's the facts and the technology of patent cases, or maybe sort of just the case management skills of dealing with um, complex patent litigation. So all that suggests, right, like I mean, what, we may want specialization um, at, at the trial level, whether in the district courts in the form of something like the patent pilot program, or you noted, um, obviously the PTAB is developing a lot of expertise on, on both technology and, and, and validity issues. But I think like the other thing you might, the, the, like is worth adding to that is, you know, not only is, have we located um, the expertise at the wrong level being at the appellate level, given that what's complicated is the facts. But now with the creation of the PTAB, we have this potentially problematic dynamic where you have an expert agency, right? Like 
being reviewed by an expert court, right? And now, you know, now we we're just doing this in another project, right? Well over half of the federal circuit's patent appeals these days come from the PTAB, right? And so if you're thinking back about the history and the reasons why we created the federal circuit, right? Well, it was because, you know, there were, you know, bring in some expertise for the generalist judges. Um, you had these cases spread out among the different district, district courts, right? So even district courts themselves um, couldn't develop any sort of expertise, but now you do have sort of the expertise at the lower level. And now you have an expert, expert tribunal reviewing those decisions. Like there is no input um, for, for broader perspectives at all. Um, and so that's another, I mean, I think it's just another, I don't know, it's a critique or at least at least something that should be, be thought about um, when you're thinking about the structure and whether, whether expertise is located at the right place. Um, and for David, like, um, so I really, I, I really appreciated the deep dive into non-mutual issue preclusion. Um, because like, it's really important, right? If you're thinking about like the, the, the hundred years of Paul Janicki's article, like for like 95 years of that, the complaints were really about the problems that were solved by Blondertongue. Um, you know, you can't have uh, a patent that's been held invalid in one circuit, subsequently held valid in another circuit. That, that's just not possible anymore. Um, and it's worth noting, I think, you know, Blondertongue was decided, you know, less than 10 years before the Federal Courts Improvement Act was passed. And so, you know, almost it's just like we should have waited a little bit longer um, and seen, you know, if the complaints about inconsistency among the regional circuits, forum shopping among the regional circuits may have been tempered in the wake of Blonder Tongue, um, probably more than, more than we really did before the Federal Circuit proposal started to get um, legs in the late 1970s. So, so I think that's a, a huge part of the story here. Um, and it's also part of the story that I was telling in the sense of like, you know, Blonder Tongue solves unif the, the unif adjudicative uniformity problem really as much as the courts can, right? Because in the other direction, due process just doesn't allow, right? You can't bind a non-party to a case to a prior case's decision rejecting a prior defendant's validity defense, right? Like you just can't do it. Um, you can't bind a, a non-party um, in that way, right? Maybe the prior decision sort of is persuasive and it's obviously there in the background and maybe the judge takes into consideration, but you can't bind the non-party to the judgment from the prior case. Uh, what you could do is bind the non um, bind at least the parties um, more forcefully in the AIA proceedings than the AIA currently does, right? You could have stronger estoppel provisions in the AIA, but again, that's not a problem really the federal circuit can can solve because the AIA itself sort of contemplates, um, you know, although framed as alternatives to litigation, it really sort of structurally comp contemplates the parallel proceedings and the sequ sequential proceedings um, that we've seen. So again, it's sort of, you know, story of, you know, what can the federal circuit do about this? I'm not sure it can do a whole lot. Um, so so that, that's one, one, just one comment, one thought. Um, the, the other thing was, you know, thinking about it from, a, so that from above, right, that what the Supreme Court and its potential lack of expertise in patent law, um, you know, the Supreme Court is never going to be expert in patent law, but, you know, arguably outside of like maybe fields like, you know, constitutional law, I'm not sure the Supreme Court's an expert in any field. Um, but what might make things different today than in 1982 is I think a lot of what you said, which is, you know, patent law is a regular part of the court's docket now, right? And so maybe it's not an expert and maybe it doesn't get every case right, but I'm not sure that distinguishes patent law from any other field of federal law, right? Patent law is part of the mainstream. There are Supreme Court cases about it. Sometimes the court grants the right one. Sometimes it grants the wrong one. Sometimes it denies petitions it, sh it should grant. You know, sometimes it makes a good decision on the merits. Sometimes it makes a bad decision on the merits. But there's nothing unique about patent law in that story, right? We could convene a panel of bankruptcy professors or securities professors, and they would all probably say the same things, which is like, eh, the Supreme Court doesn't really get our field, right? Um, but that doesn't justify, like, I don't think that tells us a whole lot about the optimal institutional structure of the system because patent law is not you know, unique in any way. And if anything, it tells us that, you know, maybe the patent system should probably look, at least at the appellate level, look a little bit more like those other areas of law. Um, so I don't know, those were not questions I realized and I failed to add question marks, but hopefully um, I've offered something interesting to continue the conversation. Absolutely, I, I don't think we need necessarily questions, but I definitely wanna um, ask Dr. Pedraza-Farina to respond. 
Yeah, sure. So this is that's super. I loved your comments, and I have a lot of thoughts about them. Um, the first one was um, when you were talking about sort of the the relationship between clear rules and then like this whole jurisprudence of claim construction and infringement, right? And I think it's quite interesting because clear rules don't necessarily align with deference. And I think that's kind of a problem that we have with the federal circuit, right? So there's a way that we could sort of meld our two, right? Our two perspectives, because um, in a way you, there's one way of to view clear rules that would align with deference. I'm like, hey, now we give the district court guidance and then the district court is gonna do what we tell it to do. So therefore we will defer. Uh, but actually, the right the federal circuit hasn't done that, and that's kind of clear in in, in claim construction as well. That uh, uh, to the extent that you can construe things as being in the province of the federal circuit, the federal circuit has tended to do that, um, and that's sort of interesting. I had written in, um, priorly thinking about that as kind of like an uh, an offshoot of expertise, right? That the federal circuit in some ways has this expertise, has these rules that wants to bind the district court, but doesn't want to bind itself. So it might uh, end up creating something potentially unpredictable. So I think that's sort of interesting thinking about clear rules and deference. Um, in terms of claim construction, um, yeah, th there's this whole debate about as to whether like, is it that the federal circuit is trying to create this ambiguity or is it sort of the nature of the beast, right? That is creating um, that, is creating that ambiguity. Um, but in terms of um, your question or like the way you were framing the issue, right? So where, should we locate the expertise? Um, there's a lot of interesting ways to think about it. So um, it might seem sort of logical, like we're thinking of a technological expertise, right? It might think logical to think about it in terms of fact. And I guess one thing that I wanna push back on just to think in this conversation that I'm not sure there is such a thing as getting the law right, right? So, so going back to what the other panels were talking about, that we do have to be aware that some of these decisions are contested and they do depend to a large extent on priors, right? On whether you think that there should be strong patent rights to foster innovation or whether, right? Um, and even on ways of thinking about patents, right? Patents as, a, as regulation versus patents as strong private rights. So given that, uh, I, would add that also what we need is sort of this more um, sort of economic expertise, right? That, that, and that's why I just think it's very odd if you were to design the, the system from scratch, right? That we don't have a robust administrative agency that's just trying to figure out, hey, what are the, what's the effect of patents on the economy, what, right? And trying to do like a more sort of sophisticated um, economic analysis and cost benefit analysis, right? Um, and so this is why I would favor they, but I sort of like, this is pie in the sky, right? Like I sort of totally reimagine uh, PTO because I do think we need this other type of expertise we haven't talked about, which is like sort of economic structural expertise. And the PTO at least is trying to do work in this um, direction. Um, so, uh, and the other the last comment I'll make about this idea of like, now we have two expert courts, right? Yeah, and that um, that can be, I think I could imagine that either being a problem or being a good thing. Um, so in the past, we've seen the, the federal circuit not being deferential to the PTO at all. And you could imagine this idea of like expert competition for jurisdiction, right? That they're, the two domains are going to clash. On the other hand, you could imagine that expert competition might be good and that like you flesh out, it's almost like circuit competition, right? Like you flesh out multiple sort of technical ways of thinking about the law. So maybe the PTAB and the, and the, and having the PTAB and the district court might be kind of like a replacement in a way for like this idea of um, circuit splits or circuit competition. Excellent. So I'll, I'll take the moderator's privilege and I guess panelist's privilege. I'm, I'm going to provide my responses to the, the two presentations as well. And, and we'll, by the way, uh, encourage everyone else to submit their questions too. Um, yeah, so this criticism of the federal circuit and bright line rules, uh, it's its an old criticism we've seen. I mean, certainly the Supreme Court seems to re repeatedly not like bright line rules and replace them with the, the opposite, like a standard, a flexible standard. I've written about this before. I think the criticism of rules is actually overblown. Um, certainly the, the the standard approach is that, uh, or the, the normal argument, the regular argument is uh, that a standard allows for balancing of factors and that results in correct decisions being reached based on the particular facts and the particular circumstances. 
even if they're not predictable, it, you reach the right result more often. Um, but, you know, we're talking about, I think, property rights. We could debate whether they're property rights, I guess, but um, patent rights, I think, are property rights. Uh, and there's certainly, even the Supreme Court, I don't have the case name in mind, but I think it was a trademark case, but effectively said, you know, sometimes we have to, um, uh, predictability is more important than accuracy, and particularly with respect to property rights. And so I've written before, I think there's a little bit of an overgrown criticism of bright lines. Um, for example, I don't know, should we expect investors to invest heavily in technology startup companies if there's a 50-50 chance their patents might be valid, 40% chance, right? So, I mean, I think that's the idea of the patent system. And um, so, Anyways, uh, there's some value in, in rules and clear, predictable outcomes. And of course, I think there's problems associated with them too, but we should recognize at least that there is some value in rules. And then um, I'm focusing on this idea of, uh, of again, my I, the bomb I threw, which is, well, why should the, who should ultimately decide these? Should we take it away from the Supreme Court? Could Congress say Supreme Court has no jurisdiction over appeals or petitions or anything in patent cases, we're going to have this expert body. Maybe it's the federal circuit. Maybe it's a super duper version, super duper where we require all the judges to have a science or engineering background. I mean, it's theoretically possible. Uh, we, we don't have that in any area, certainly, as you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Professor Guglielsa, but indeed some countries, if we think about other countries, other countries around the world have consistently gone in the direction of creating specialized patent appellate courts. I mean, I'll work through examples. Uh, the Federal Court of Justice in Germany includes a 10th Senate, has eight judges to hear appeals and patent cases. South Korea inc includes a patent court that hears intermediate appeals and patent cases. Uh, I was going through my students' research in one of my classes, pulling what they had found. Singapore includes specialist patent judges on its high court general division. They call it the IP court. And some of these are relatively recent, right? After the formation of the Federal Circuit in particular. So in 2009, India created a semi-specialized appellate court to appear to hear appeals in patent cases. 2019, most recently, China created a specialized IP court within its Supreme People's Court. And Europe has been working, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but they've been working towards a unified patent court, a court of last resort, I think other than constitutional matters perhaps, but uh, I think it's the ultimate, if, if it's ever created, right? UK's um, pulled out, but... Um, so do we have unique concerns with specialization that these other countries do not? Is it that we have been conducted the experiment longer perhaps and we've seen problems? Or do these countries have innovations that we ought to adopt to modify the federal circuit experiment? I'm not sure, but it seems interesting to me that the rest of the world seems to be converging around specialized patent appellate courts. Can I ask and jump in on that international point? Based on your students' research, how influential was the federal circuit, in particular the federal circuit's judges, in convincing those other countries to follow the federal circuit model? Right, because I mean, one of the one of the potential observations about the federal circuit is the judges themselves have been very strong ambassadors for the U.S. patent system, and particularly for the court itself. Right, I mean, Judge Rader regularly traveled abroad to sort of tout the court. Um, hosted judges from other countries at the federal circuit um, and was very sort of international minded, right? And so I guess the question would be like, is this really an international consensus or is this another, yet another example of sort of the federal circuit, um, you know, using its platform to try to bring global notoriety to the court itself and the patent law more broadly? Yeah, and just to answer your question, no, my students did not uh, engage in trying to decide. That's the next exactly, assignment. Then. <laughs> exactly why, in those countries, they adopted it. But but I um, agree, the Federal Circuit judges have been ambassadors of their own court. It seems. I just wanted to jump in on that too. I think it is really interesting. It's another area of legal research. It's super interesting, right? To think about the diffusion, it's just the diffusion of law, right? And um, Many of you probably had this experience. I've certainly had this experience that I've had LLM students where you can trace. So give you an example, Columbia, doctrine of equivalence, right? Now, Columbia apparently now is gonna have a doctrine of equivalence and it's all because you can trace it to an LLM student at Duke who took a class 
and learn about the US patent of equivalence, right? And then like very prominent person, it's just, right? And so you have to be a little bit skeptical. There's this like networks of influence, right? And uh, to the extent that, uh, right. And it's, but that would be an interesting project, right? So sort of like map the networks of influence of uh, US, uh, US patent law. I certainly have uh, other examples where um, there was a, a patent code and I forget exactly, I don't wanna name the wrong country, but where the trademark statute was just basically like the US trademark statute, right? It just kind of got imported. So that's kind of like a really interesting, um, just, you know, thought in terms of comparative law, to what extent you think these are independent um, events? They're probably not. All right, I'm looking to the q and I think we have about five minutes left. If you have questions, feel free to submit them. If other prior panelists have questions, of course, they can submit them as well. Uh, I have one other question, maybe for just kind of for Laura. Like, so one thing I'm, I'm curious, to get your thoughts about is um, the effect of the AIA, right? Like, I think like in the lead up to the AIA, right? Like no one thought it was gonna, particularly like IPR and PGR, like IPR in particular, no one thought it was gonna be like as important or as like revolutionary to the patent system as it ended up being. And so I think maybe one consequence of that in retrospect was like, no one really cared about the question of appellate review. They're like, it's patent stuff, it'll go to the federal circuit's fine, right? But if we knew that like these cases were gonna take up like more than half of the federal circuit's docket, would the appropriate, both sort of like standards of appellate review and sort of procedure of appellate review maybe actually have been something that was part of the discussion in the lead up to the AIA? Um, or is it a discussion we should have now, particularly because of the way the AIA has transformed the federal circuit's docket, right? And not just in terms of the AIA cases themselves, but I also got to thinking about this because you're talking about, you know, having a stronger administrative agency that maybe has rulemaking power and can make decisions based on like economics and any other considerations. It's like the more and more like we're like putting all this pressure into the PTO, both in terms of policy and resolving disputes, like there's a, there seems to be like more and more tenuous the case for specialized appellate review, right? Like if the PTO is taking into account like broad economic considerations, why would we send all these cases to this court with like incredibly narrow specialized jurisdiction? Why not send them to the more generalist courts? Why not send them to like the DC circuit? Like a lot of administrative agencies. Um, it just seems that like the more um, lawmaking and policymaking pressure we're putting on the PTO that just seems to undercut the case for the federal circuit's existence even more. Yeah, so I'm gonna um, highlight a comment that was in the chat. Um, a, an additional benefit of the federal circuit, right? Compared to general federal litigation. I mean, I teach contracts as this semester and I'm teaching the common law of contracts and there's so many jurisdictions and there's so much, and there's difference of views and uh, difficult to, to do the research. And the, pointed out in the chat, um, the federal circuit makes figuring out what the law is a little easier and more cost effective. I know uh, we were talking earlier about um, the patent bar capturing the federal circuit. I think um, that was the idea. It's not the, the clients, but the bar. In this sense, the federal circuit benefits the bar in the sense they, they can do their research a little easier. It's easier to track and figure out what the law is by looking at one court's decisions rather than many, many, many different courts. Um, but um, by the way, when I talk about this in, in class, usually my, st my students would, would love to generate more cost and more expense because they would love to be paid more and take more time, I think, to do tests because they would make more money. So I'm not sure exactly which way that cuts um, in the end, but I, I highlight the, the point. I think Dr. Pedraza Farina, you think you were gonna make a comment? Um, yeah, so, um... I, I mean, I tend to think that, you know, for example, think about environmental law, right? You have like a robust environmental law agency, right? And I just don't see patent. I mean, again, this is probably not going to happen, right? So like we're, I'm, I'm in there sort of like the, uh, doing it from scratch. So I do, I but I do think you're right, Paul, that if, if you start expanding the PTO, which in fact we're doing, right? Uh, then you are creating a lot of pressure on a single circuit. Uh, it is quite a, quite interesting that some of the data that was presented earlier, I think by Jason, that the federal circuit is actually affirming right most of the PTAB decisions, which is interesting because you can uh, we could try to figure out why that's the case. Uh, certainly, earlier orientation by the federal circuit was quite antagonistic to the PTO in that they wouldn't just right it was just sort of this expert competition, but maybe now. Um, 
maybe this is like just there's just too many cases and so they're gonna write there's like there's an avalanche of cases and there's just um uh affirming them i don't i don't know how to take that what appears yeah. to be a change too many cases in the nature of the cases too right like they're not easy cases to reverse it's like fact finding um mm -hmm. even if you want to be aggressive like there's a limit to how much work you could do to justify constant reversals on like you know back right. intensive issues even yeah. if you call them questions of law um, you still got to like justify the decision in some way. Yeah, so the yeah. law is doing work, right? So, which is great to do things. Well, I will, I will say this though, and Jason uh, didn't present this data, but I've done some data. I don't have a slide to present, but compared to the BPAI, the, the PTAB, the reversal rate is actually not that different. There's just a, a lot more of these cases. And so now we see, oh my gosh, there's all these summary affirmances. Rule 36 summary affirmances at the federal circuit. And it seems like a seems like they're doing it more often. Well, they are doing it more often as an absolute matter, uh, matter, but in reality, I don't think the difference in the rate at which they're granting summary affirmance is all that different than it was historically before the PTAB. It's just more salient now. Um, PTAB is much, you know, inter partes cases, I think, um, when there's a real dispute, where there's millions of dollars at stake. Um, they get litigated harder. There's their inner partes, right? And so they're 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 much more um, important to to one of the parties, the government uh, in these ex parte cases, right? I joke with my students, it's a bureaucrat, and I mean that in the best sense. There's a person examiner or PTAB judge. They don't have a personal stake, but when you get into a personal stake in the outcome, the the depths and the the money that's spent to find the prior art. All over the world now and now we can have you know under the AI all types of prior art anywhere even sales and public uses but um the, the, anyways the cases are much more um there's much more publicity and um and maybe that's why the supreme court's taking more cases i mean the more money at stake um bigger more high profile i mean we're seeing we didn't mention it today i think it's worth mentioning all of these former solicitor generals of the united states getting involved in patent disputes at the federal circuit. And um, I don't know, Professor Gooley, is it that's your if that's part of the patent bar now, I guess. And so the prestige factor has certainly gone up. And I guess uh, maybe maybe the judges want to continue that and they like that. I'm not sure. Um, all right. Well, as it turns out, a wonderful day, three very interesting panels. Um, I think we are at time and I've got the time right on this one. So let me just thank this panel. I really appreciate um, your participation. It's been great. Um, the Dean mentioned, I wanna thank Natalie Greco, also James Pan uh, for their assistance with the symposium today. I wanna thank Jacob Young, who's going to help. Um, by the way, the panelists have agreed to submit written forms of their remarks um, for publication on the Fed Circuit blog. And so we'll be doing that. We're gonna allow them some time to um, think more about what we've discussed today and get final versions of them, and then we'll edit them, format them, get them on the blog. But I'm looking forward to seeing those on the blog. So I, I want to thank everybody, um, all eight of the panelists besides myself um, that participated today. It's been a great day, very interesting topics, very insightful commentary. So with that, it concludes the SMU's 18th IP Symposium. Have a great rest of your Friday and a great Halloween weekend. <laughs>